Water. I am Monica Smith, your extension educator at Kent MSU Extension. I'm a registered dietitian and my specialties are uh, anything having to do with food. I'm so glad that you're here today to learn about feeding kids with confidence because it seems like the more complex our society gets, the harder it gets for us to do some of the most basic, simple things that we used to take for granted, like feeding our children, right? This has become a really complex issue, so much so that moms don't often feel competent in doing this anymore. And um, that's really hard if you feel like you can't feed your child well. Just want to remind you that um, this presentation is brought to you in part by the United States Department of Agriculture SNAP program. Um, this is your food stamp dollars at work. We are always uh, open to anyone, anytime. MSUE um, nor SNAP discriminates um, for anyone. So we're an affirmative action equal opportunity employer and we're glad to have you all here. Just thought I would start out this with a reality check. You may find that the way we live these days is not overly supportive to creating healthy and happy eaters. Change may be required. How many of us love change? <laughs> yeah, yeah, none of us love change. Some of us love change less than others right now as we are undergoing reorganization changes, moving changes, maybe family changes. So I just wanted to tell you that up front. But here's the good news. Here's the really, really good news. With feeding children, we actually do know what works. We really do. The things that work are division of responsibility, boundaries, who's responsible for what, when, where, how much, how fast. Knowing who's responsible and sticking to that is a wonderful thing. We also know it works um, if you understand the developmental capabilities of a child at any given age. Nobody in here would probably hand a six-month-old child a slice of pizza. That's not a part of their developmental capability, right? Nor would you give a 17-year-old a jar of baby food and expect a happy response, okay? We also know that expanding horizons work. The more variety you eat, the healthier you are, and the more you're exposed to it, the more likely you're going to be able to accept variety. We also know that limiting exposure to highly processed foods works. Sugar, fat, sodium are fairly addictive. Um, they create a taste, sensation, and cycle that's very hard to break. So if you raise a child on foods, that are highly processed, high in sodium, high in sugar, high in fat, they're going to find green beans rather dull, okay? Let me talk to you a little bit about division of responsibility. Anybody know about division of responsibility? Anybody heard of that? Our friend Mary has heard of that. We may not think of this, but feeding is a relationship between the caregiver and the child. You're born. What happens? You get taken care of. And what's the very first thing that somebody tries to take care of you with? <clears throat> Food, bottle or breast, right? From that moment, the relationship between caregiver and, and newborn is developed. But it is a relationship. Providing nutrition is one of the most primal things that can happen between a caregiver and their child. If you can't provide food for your child, how do you feel? Mm -hmm inadequate, you feel bad, you feel incompetent, you probably feel terrified, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Right? And from the child's point of view, asking for food and being fed and being reinforced as a competent eater, that's one of the very first and best ways that you can reinforce that that child has a strong sense of self and is capable. So you ask, who's responsible for what? There's adult roles and there are child roles. Adults need to choose what. Children do not have the developmental capability to choose what. So, the food that goes on the plate is the adult's responsibility. It's my role as the adult to say, the food for dinner is chicken, peaches, and tomatoes. 
when it's my role to decide when meal time is, when snack time is, and where. What do you think about the idea of having a safe environment to eat in? Has anybody ever thought about unsafe eating environments? Children feel unsafe when there's chaos, when there's loud noises, when there's competing stimuli, when there are multiple things going on and they don't know, should I be watching television or should I be eating? Should I be playing with my little brother or should I be eating? Should I be concerned about this argument that's happening over here between these two persons, or am I supposed to be eating? This creates a lot of anxiety for children. The setting in which a child eats is really important, and that is what a child feels safe or unsafe in. And it's the adult's responsibility to create that environment. The child has a responsibility. How much to eat, if any. Now, I want to assure you that any normal, developmentally normal, healthy child will not starve themselves. Has anybody ever read in the paper, child falls out, dies of hunger from refusing to eat? Have you ever read that ever one time? Do you think it would be big news if it happened? Oh, absolutely. I'm telling you, they simply will not starve themselves. They may make you miserable, but they will not starve themselves. And it's a child's responsibility to determine how fast or how slow to eat. Uh-oh. Has anybody got one of those really slow eaters at home? Oh, my goodness. Will that try your patience? Does anybody have the gobbler? Three bites, you're out. Let's go. Chop, chop, Mom. There's a baseball game just outside the window. But it is the child's responsibility to decide how fast or slow. Now, when you're talking about the choosing what, this gets to be real hard for people, right? Choosing what has to be based on family-friendly foods. I mean, really, I'm not going to put a five-year-old at the table and feed them artichokes unless that's been their cultural food that they've been raised with. I'm not going to say, hey, Junior, we're having artichokes today. That is not family-friendly. Has anybody ever eaten an artichoke? It's, it's interesting, isn't it? Because I thought my grandma used to make them for us. So, so this is a cultural family food for her. Her five-year-old, if you have a five-year-old, might think, oh, boy, artichokes. Now, if he brings a friend home. Yeah, my husband wouldn't eat them for about uh, probably a year, but now he loves them. So it, it took her a year to get an adult to venture into artichokes, okay? So family-friendly nutrition decisions have to be based on good nutrition and pleasure, but not necessarily on what children are perceived to like or what they're perceived to eat. Here's one. Their plate should look like your plate, <coughs> just smaller plates. A parent having an adult meal and a child having a child meal already creates a problem. Children are already questioning what's going on here. This cognitive dissonance, children do not like things that do not match. They really don't. When you're introducing new foods, you do it over and over and over and over again. That goes for children and it goes for adults. I'm sure the husband was exposed to artichokes more than once before he became a fan of artichokes, all right? And here's one. How Does this strike fear to anybody's heart? Do not cater to children's food preferences. Because if we cater to children's food preferences, we become part of the short order cook syndrome, right? But if we don't, what will happen? They will learn to take a variety of foods. Perhaps they will learn to take a variety of foods. Perhaps they will feel confident, I'll watch you eat it, and if you eat it and you don't disappear mm -hmm. or melt down or blow up, Maybe it's okay. Another alternative is they can also create havoc at the table, right? They can become beastly. Or when they're teens, like my daughter, she ate really well when she was young, but now that she's old, older and can be her own short order cook, she can sometimes prepare her own things if she doesn't care. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and how this translates, this translates uh, for different stages, right? The, the eight-month-old versus the four-year-old versus the 12-year-old and the 17-year-old, that comes out being really different. 
how that response is. And this is a big one, and this is an especially big one for people in poverty that may feel that they have little to offer their children in the way of um, tangible reward, not to use food as reward or punishment or a pacifier. Food is something that you should not have to earn. You are born, you're here, you deserve to be fed. We have ample food in our community to feed one another and to be fed well. You shouldn't have to earn food. Nor when you do something good, should food be used as a reward or as a way to keep you quiet. Here, have a bag of popcorn and get out of my hair. Um, we've all done it, but it's not such a good idea. It sets up patterns in children that make them less than healthy, happy eaters. This is what happens when adults don't choose what? Children develop their own food rules. Picky eater can go to non-eater, and then they get really overwhelmed when they can't choose. When you see a child that's paralyzed by a plate of food, my guess is they've been given too many options. It's not that they don't have enough options. Or they've been given too much food. They look at the amount of food and it's just huge. Power struggles at mealtime. I know how to get your attention. I'm not going to eat. I'm only going to eat yogurt. No, I'm only going to eat potato chips. No, this week I'm only going to eat peanut butter. Have you seen that one? The food of the week and you have no idea what it is? Uh-huh. Short order chef syndrome like I was talking about. Food obsessions can emerge where children feel like they can't um, function without having visible food, enough food, the certain kind of food, and it can become very scary for children. New foods can become very scary for children when adults don't say, this is what you should be eating. I'm going to leave it up to you to decide what to eat. The child says, ah, oh, don't want that responsibility. I'm only four. I, I, I can't handle it. Again, kids learn they can manipulate the family by making mealtime miserable. Who has ever sat in a restaurant and watched that happen? I won't ask you to confess your own children being naughty, <laughs> but you have all seen somebody else's children doing it, right? And come on, how many of you know adolescents and adults that still think chicken nuggets and fries is a gourmet meal? <laughs> That's as far as they've expanded their horizons. They haven't eaten a new food in 25 years. That's what happens when adults don't choose what? People get stuck in child choosing mode. And I'm wondering, look at this little guy. I love this picture. <laughs> look at him. What do you think's going on with him? It's too much. He's completely overwhelmed. Does that look family friendly? He looks so confused. He looks, the poor thing is so confused. Look at this. Now, this, this is one of my pet peeves right here. With, with, anybody watch food TV and they prepare these? This, this kind of a sandwich is one of my pet peeves. Who could possibly eat that with any type of grace and dignity? <laughs> All right? <laughs> Oh yes, this is this is a disaster waiting to happen. Look at the size of the plate. Is this child primed to make a mess? Look, and this is a classic thing that we see happen all the time. This is a beautiful green, lots of veggies that looks like whole grain bread and looks like it's got some nice turkey here. By all rights, that's a beautiful food, but is that family friendly for a child of this age? And I'm wondering, looking at a well-meaning mistake like this, what are some of the things that make it hard, do you think, for parents to choose the what when it comes to, to family meals for their children? Sometimes it's ignorance. They just don't know. They just, you don't know what you don't know. You, you don't know what you don't know. It's hard for them to choose what because they don't know what. They themselves don't know what to choose, do they? And if the child is willing to choose it for him, it takes that responsibility away, right? Do you think there's any other things that make it hard for parents to choose what? Time. Like they're just stressed because they've worked all day. They don't, they don't necessarily come home. They have to deal with, you know, what am I going to make that? Yeah. Sure. Time. Stress. I cannot face. I've had a hard day. I cannot face not one 
battle at the table tonight. I don't want to hear any complaining. Everybody will eat macaroni and cheese. It's the 18th time we've had it this month. But you know what? There will be no power struggles if I have macaroni and cheese, right? And how long does it take to make? Two minutes? Yeah, time is a big one. What about just the want to please them so they give them everything? Please. I want to please my child, but my child really likes peanut butter and yogurt. You know, and, and I want them to have what they want, right? Because I, I love my child. Yes, we want our children to have what they want. One thing I've noticed, um, and I have a friend that, you know, they're very, very professional. Um, and what she had, had done was overwhelm the child with foods that were not developmentally appropriate. And, and this child was um, over a year, but feeding, when she got home from work, she felt guilty if she didn't have something on and have it right for him. And then she and her husband wanted quiet time, so they did not have a family meal. Oh! This child is, is, oh, yes. is given. The what? Because there's not, you get home, the child is hungry right now. Yes. You want to give the food, the child food right now, but that does not give you time to create a family meal. So the child is eating something that you've pulled from 20 different places um, that they love. You've got the, the Lunchable, you've got the crackers, you've got this, okay, now you're taken care of. Okay, let me sit down a minute and I'll regroup and then I'll eat, my husband and I will eat separately. And the whole time, this whole dynamic of family eating, that's gone. Yeah, what? Who, when people need to eat at different times, makes it hard to choose what, right? Take some planning. Look at this kid. They put the same plate of food in front of this kid and look at him. This is not a happy camper. Now, how tempted would you be to give this child a chicken nugget? If that you knew if this child would eat it dependably, are you not tempted at this point to give this child a chicken nugget? Of course you are, he looks miserable. Even if everybody else in the family's having this, look at the size of this plate. Look, it's, his, it's the width of his body. What if you had a plate like that? If I sat down and had a plate like that, I'd be, wow, <laughs> scary. The lunch that ate Grand Rapids, right? <laughs> Frightening. Look at this poor guy. He's got a plate the size, he's got a small community garden on his plate. He looks miserable. You would be tempted to feed this child something else, to change the what, when maybe taking half this food off the plate and adding a, one more family friendly food to this that you know he likes. Perhaps a, maybe even a third of this off the plate and then on, with that plate could perhaps be um, some turkey, sliced turkey like for sandwiches that you know that this child might like. Or perhaps maybe you know that this child likes um, what about fruit? You could add some fruit, fruit or a ravioli, or maybe you know this child likes bread. You could put a roll on the plate. Because something familiar on the plate is always a nice place to start, right? If you walk into a room, those of you that walked into this room today, if you knew at least one other person, did that not make you feel better? Sure. Any one familiar item always sets us at ease, and that's true for the plate as well. Now look at this guy. What do you think about him? Bless his heart, he's strapped in. <laughs> okay, he's safe. We know he's safe. Now, he's got, he still looks a little unsure, doesn't he? He looks a little unsure, but he's, he's got just a few orange slices, not too many. Mm, that looks like a lot of sandwich for him, don't you think? Look at that yeah. picture. Maybe, maybe not be so close to the table, too. He just is yeah. bored, but he looks like he's... It's easy for him to handle and stuff. The food looks like it's very friendly for him to handle. He still looks a little overwhelmed and unsure, but he's willing to take a bite. So, so this mom or caregiver has done something right because he is venturing into eating, but maybe if a piece of this sandwich was gone and he had only two small pieces might be better for him. Yeah. But my question is, I'd love to see what's going on at the rest of the table. Is this the same meal that everybody else is eating? Oh. Does this look like a meal that you would eat? This looks like egg salad and, and oranges. I might eat that with a glass of milk. I could have that for lunch. So if everybody else in the family is eating this, maybe that's why he's willing to take that bite, even though he looks a little unsure. Why would, she, why would there be that much food? Yeah, it looks like a lot. This needs to go. 
She's got at least half a sandwich too much. And then add. Yes. Overwhelmed. Yeah, I really I like the idea of starting with a little and adding more. But then that becomes, I've got to get up and do it. But if you're serving food family style with the sandwiches, this brings this makes a point for serving food family style. Makes it very easy to add another bite or two, right? And it would also give this child the autonomy mm -hmm. to do this, right? Meaning more. Yeah. Might reach out and ask for more. And it also gives them the chance to say, I'm done. done. You know what, Bonnie, <coughs> I look at this too. And that bothers me that the child's strapped in. Yes. I'm not trusting him. Yes. Because I'm going to strap you in because this is the business of the day. Yes. Right You're strapped in. What if, if he, does that keep him in place when he really doesn't want to eat? I don't know. He doesn't need any support. Maybe, maybe if he's at the table with other people, maybe he doesn't need to be strapped in. That could change the whole dynamic there. Now, when we're talking about choosing when, okay, this is big. <laughs> If you shoot arrows at me, I understand that this is controversial. All right? I get it. I know I'm in danger. Children need structure. This is an adult role. Regular meal times, regular snack times that are predictable. Do you see how this is not conducive to a lifestyle in 2010? We're running hither, tither, and yon. We may not eat at the same time every day. Children need family meals. They need to watch other people be successful eaters. They need to see what the family meal is like. Do you see how that may not be conducive for life in 2010? And here's the big one, folks. Regular meals, regular snacks. No in-between meal and snack time grazing. Only water. No juice, no milk no soda, no nothing but water in between scheduled meal times. So many of our nutrition instructors will tell us they go to the home and the mom says, my child won't eat. Well, we look at the child and we see the child looks very developmentally appropriate. The child is not underweight. The child doesn't eat at meals because the child all day long is going to the refrigerator, getting a piece of cheese, has access to juice, milk, um, other caloric beverages, the child never feels hungry at mealtime. Never feels hungry at mealtime. So the child pulls up, sits at the table, if there is a family meal, and goes, actually, I already ate. He just doesn't have the words to say that because he's three. He doesn't, can't say, well, actually, Mom, I had a half a sandwich and some cheese and some pretzels and some milk, and then somebody gave me some juice, and the lady in the drive-thru gave me some um, candy. No, no, no in between food, beverage, food or beverage grazing. You have set meals, set snacks. That's when the child eats. If the child doesn't choose to eat at that time, that's okay because the next meal or snack is going to be two or three hours away. Nobody's ever perished in two or three hours. You have breakfast, you have a snack, you have lunch, you have a snack, you have dinner. Depending on how long it is before the child goes to bed, there may be another snack. The child knows when they're coming, can count on it, and feels confident in it. The child misses one, the next one's coming. And a snack is a snack, not a treat. That's a whole nother lunch and learn topic. This is what happens when adults don't choose when. They tend to either overeat or undereat. They can become anxious and insecure about food. They don't know when they're going to be fed, so when they see food, they react to it in either a positive or negative way. There's no consistent model for how to eat well. Children learn by what they see. Now, they do learn by what we tell them, and what we tell our children is important. But I can assure you, especially small children, what they see is ever so much more important to them than what they hear. Not to mention the fact that it becomes very chaotic to organize, plan, prepare meals. When you're, everybody's eating and grazing on the fly, it's very hard not to compromise the nutritional value of the meals, and it's also expensive. I mean, do you want to eat that piece of cheese that your child took a bite of and left on the table two hours ago? <laughs> How many of you have ever found a, a, an apple with three bites taken out of it behind your sofa? <laughs> oh, you feel my pain, don't you? Now, that's wasted food. 
and wasted nutrition. And somewhere that mom probably thought that that apple was eaten and that cheese was eaten, but actually the dog finished off the cheese and you found the apple three weeks later. So, knowing how important it is for parents to choose when to eat, what do you think makes it hard to choose when? Schedules. We all have competing schedules. Lots of times, mom, dad, teen, younger child are all on different schedules, right? Does anybody work rotating shifts? Many parents don't even work the same shifts every day, do they? You work the hours that you are, are glad to get, wherever they may be. Um, what about school vacation? Doesn't that change everything when people get up, when they go to bed? What else? Appointments. Appointments. That one appointment that that doctor has is when? 1130, yeah. right? That one program that you want to take is at 530. Why do they schedule so many adult learning things between yes. 5 and 7? <laughs> Have you noticed that? Right at mealtime. You might also. Mom, mom, dad, caregiver may also may not be hungry because they've been grazing all day. And so, yeah, maybe I don't want to have dinner tonight at 6 because, you know what, I just stopped on the way home because I was starving and went to the drive-thru. So maybe, you know, maybe I'll just wait until 8 to make dinner and I'll just, again, get out the chicken nuggets for, for baby George. This is one of my favorite all-time pictures about how schedules can get in the way. As you can see, this mom and baby are on a field trip, okay? They're at the museum. Yeah. And as you can see, you know how time can get away from you at the museum and you're just all involved in it? And, you know, this one's a little bit too young to say, uh, hey, mom, let's nurse, but saw a great opportunity here and decided to self-feed. So this is one of my favorite all-time pictures in how even having a good time can get in the way of regular feeding. <laughs> Choosing where. This is another important task for the adult. Food needs to be eaten at the table. It is a stand-alone activity. It is worthy of being a stand-alone activity. There is nothing else that you need to do at any given time other than breathe that merits any more attention than eating. And so food that is not given that kind of attention becomes chaotic. It becomes not important. Avoid eating on the run. Oops. Avoid eating on the run in the car, walking around the mall, in front of the TV, those are all highly chaotic environments for children. They really cannot process all that stimuli. And though you may be fine to walk down the mall, push the stroller, eat a burrito, have the Coke right here, your child is sitting there with his or her half sandwich going, mm -hmm. and you don't know what but it's laying on the floor and you're still going. <laughs> and then the person behind you steps in your sandwich. TV, loud music, distractions. Children do not have the neural connections. This is developmentally crucial. Children do not have the neural connections to focus music, television, talking, food. You really need to help them focus on task at hand. Modeling polite conversation at the table. Another thing that makes children feel unsafe is if there is an environment of scolding, yelling, fussing, being critical at the table. When you start to connect negative emotions with food, it becomes very difficult for children to want to eat. The table becomes a scary place, not a safe place. When adults don't choose where, when you let the child choose where, and where do children choose to eat? In front of the TV, where else? Well, running, back and forth. running back and forth, absolutely. Because life, I just got mobile. I don't really care to sit. There's a big world to explore. Running about, where else? On the run. On the run. On, no matter where it is, they've got a big world to explore. 
and they're just now getting to do it. Though they may do that, that does not necessarily feel comfortable to them. You send the message that eating isn't important. And how many of you, now we wouldn't talk about your children, but know someone who has children that you wish would master the skills of sitting quietly, eating at the table, and having conversation? Don't you value that as a skill with children? And when you go to a restaurant and you see this happening, the family dynamic is everybody is sitting and eating and the children are talking and the parents are talking and everybody's laughing and having a good time. Don't you look at them and go, wow, how cool is that? This is a highly desirable skill set and it comes in handy the whole rest of your life. That's something that we don't, I guess I never thought about that way before and it is very important because we're so busy. When I was raising my kids, I was so busy going to work, coming home, doing this and doing that. So they had to go by my rules. So just to put that into perspective, it's just, it's like something that you need, it's a priority. You need to do this for your children and for yourself. Yes, it, you do need to do it for your children and for yourself. And it can become, it doesn't have to be, we're not talking about an hour and a half meal here. I just looked at a national study that was done in school food service in K through 12. What is the time, the average length of time, do you think that it takes for a child, K through 12, it's pretty standard throughout, to sit and eat a meal? And how was it at school? I never Seven to eight minutes. minutes. You are right on it. Eight, eight, you have got it. You are perfect. In eight to ten minutes, ten being the littlest ones, eight being the older ones, we're only talking about an eight to 10 minute window of opportunity plus the t length of time to have social niceties and engage in family um, behaviors at the table before the child is dismissed. If you don't excuse the child from the table for an hour, what can you expect? He's gonna act out. He's gonna act out because it is beyond a child's developmental capability to hold attention span for an hour. But 20 minutes with eating and engagement and low distraction and focusing can be a very attainable goal, even for a small child. This is a highly desirable skill for adults. Anybody got a friend that can't sit still? Got one, just went on vacation with her. I'm tireder than I was when I went, okay? But I had a good time. It becomes difficult to know how much your child is eating, to know what their child is eating. When you don't choose where, you can't see them. You don't know that that sandwich was dropped off the side of the stroller, maybe. You don't know about that apple. And that way, sometimes what that leads to is parents overfeeding children at mealtime. The child's really already eaten enough for the day in grazing because there was no standard meal times and it wasn't where. And it can also lead to nutrient deficiencies. A child that can decide where to eat, meaning on the run, wherever I can grab it, how are you going to know if your child really had enough milk that day, enough vegetables? You can't know. I mean, unless you can watch them every single second, and I'm sure that there are some moms that are quite competent at that, but come on. My dog gets ahead of me, so I just don't know. Now, look at this guy. He's sitting at the table, right? He's in appropriate high chair. So the wear looks pretty good, right? What about his face? Does he look happy? Even though it looks like he's in the right environment here, that still looks like a whole lot of food to me. Doesn't it look like a whole lot of food? Now, look, he's got his spoon. He's quite neat. He's doing a very good job, but he looks like he's borderline ready to cry. I'm, I'm wondering if he's, yeah, and he's got to go between two bowls. This is a big decision to make for a kid of his size. Which plate do I eat out of? It would have been less confusing for him if the mom had mixed all this together in a smaller portion. Do I eat rice? I don't know. Do I eat this, this soup? I don't know. But the wear is good. I think the wear in this picture is good. This child is in the kitchen at the table. What do you think makes it hard for parents to choose wear? When 
<laughs> oh yeah, the kitchen is a wreck from breakfast and or lunch, right? Could the table possibly have clutter on it? Could there be other members of the family that are older that prefer to watch in front of the television? Okay, this is a big one for me. Does anybody really enjoy watching a toddler eat? They're messy eaters. They're messy? Mm -hmm. It's not wholly appetizing to sit across the table from a toddler with a tomato product, is it? <laughs> and so that can make it tempting to sit, to, to choose aware where the focus is not one another at the table. All right? However, where is really important? How much? This is a child role, but the parent has to set the child up for success. Child size plates, cups, and bowls. In any of these pictures, have we seen a child with a child size plate, cup, or bowl? No. But they, we all have them, right? They come with most dinner sets. It might be called a saucer in our world, but it's still, right? Mm -hmm. Begin with a tablespoon or two of all the foods on the table. Have we seen any child with a tablespoon or two? No. Then allow your child to choose how much to eat of those foods. So you've chosen where, you've created a safe environment with the right size tableware, and now you're letting your child choose how much of those things on my plate will I eat. Here's a big one. My mother would not have gone for this. Allow more of any food on the plate other than dessert, even if the child didn't eat everything else on the plate. So let's say I have on my plate before me chicken, mashed potatoes, gravy, green beans, and corn. Let's say all I ate was my mashed potatoes and gravy and a little bit of my corn, and I want more mashed potatoes and gravy. That's okay. That's okay. Let the child decide. Is there any bad choices on that plate? No. There's no bad choices. The child didn't ask for gummy bears. You didn't give the child more fruit drink. Let the child decide. You're sitting at the table with the same plate, and you're eating it, and you can encourage. Here's your mashed potatoes and gravy. Let's take a bite of chicken. This is so good. I hate you're missing out on this. I hate it. Serve milk or water at mealtimes in child-sized cups. That's this. That's a child-sized cup. For some of us, we would refer to that as a shot glass. Okay? That's how far away we've gotten from child-sized cups. Look what happens when child children aren't allowed to choose how much. Nobody knows when somebody else is hungry or full. Our very first line against obesity is honoring what our body is asking us for, to know when we're hungry and to eat and to know when we're no longer hungry and then stop eating. Eating disorder behaviors in children who are not allowed to decide how much they get to eat are very common. You can go into any K through five lunchroom and see children who are restricting or who are hoarding. I've seen it in every single lunchroom I've been into in the last school year. The child that grabs as much food as they can from every other child's plate and the child who will sit there like this, quietly and patiently, being perfectly good, not disrupting, and looking at that food like, oh my gosh. What am I to do with that? Mm -mm, not going there. That's scary. And when children feel insecure about being able to feed themselves, how much security do you think that they might feel about other areas of their life? Everything. Everything, because food is primal, right? Yes. If you can't feed yourself, hmm, I wonder if you're going to be willing to get up in the middle of the night to go potty. I wonder if you're going to be willing to go play by yourself in the living room while I just slip into the kitchen quickly to get the laundry to bring back into the kitchen to fold. You can have chaos in two seconds, right? Mom's out of sight, complete panic. There's all kinds of ways insecurity can manifest, and some of that can really start with children feeling secure about the way they feed themselves. Here he is again. 
How secure does he look? Totally not secure. What's happening with this child? What's going on here? Look at her. What would you call this expression on her face? Stress. She's stressed. And avoidance behavior. She's avoiding. Oh, my gosh, please, why don't you understand me? She's at the verge of tears. She looks panicked. Now, what's the look of, on this mom's face? Oh, please, oh, please, oh, please, oh, please, eat. Please. This child is not being allowed to determine how much, is she? Because right now, this child might, may be saying, I don't want anything. Look at the food here. Big plate of food. Is that a tablespoon? No. no. Now, this is a child-sized cup. That's nice. <laughs> I'm wondering if the mom is putting this much energy into feeding this child. Now, how old do you think this child is? Two, three-ish, don't you think? Between two and three. Is this child developmentally capable of reaching out, picking that? Now, we're assuming this is a, a, a healthy child with no problems. Reaching out, picking up that, and putting it in her mouth. Has she been given that opportunity. Res opportunity or responsibility? Absolutely not. Now, what do you think the chances are if this mom is devoting this much attention to this, that this mom is eating? How could she possibly eat? Look how much work she's putting into this. So I'm wondering, is this the lunch that this mom is having, or dinner, I don't know what time of day this is, and does she have a plate? But this whole situation looks really not happy. How was that different from this kid? Look at him. He's a completely different kid. Now, he's still got a pretty good sized plate here. But we're getting closer, right? Mm -hmm. Now look at this family-friendly meal. This looks like peas and carrots. This is corn. Now think about those of you who understand the plate method. This kid has got just about half his plate in vegetables. This mom's done a real good job with that, hasn't she? And he's got about yeah, maybe a quarter of his plate in protein here. This looks like maybe a fish stick or a chicken. I think it looks like fish stick. She's got it cut up where he can actually reach out and grab it if the spoon fails him. He's got options here, right? He's got finger food and spoon food. Look at his face. He's very engaged. Oh my goodness, is he engaged? He's all about that corn right now. <laughs> that kid is about that corn. Yeah. Now does he look stressed at all? No. He's, he's working it. No. He's concentrating, but he's not stressed. He, he's acting like, I, I don't, I got this. don't touch me. I've got the corn. I'm working it, and I've got the spoon. I'm not even doing it with my hands here, and I'm not even using the two-hand corn method. I've got the one-hand corn method with the spoon here. I am really, I can eat like a big kid now, really says that. Really different picture of kids. How fast. <clears throat> oh, my goodness, this is the trial and tribulation of many families, the family where nobody eats at the same pace. Keep in mind that young children are doing ever so much more than eating when they are at the table. It's not just about eating. They're exploring. It's going to take longer for them to eat because they're learning all kinds of things. This little guy right here, is learning a lot of tasks right now, right? He's learning how to manage his spoon. He's learning how to make a choice. He had to choose between this. He's learning lots of things. He's learning about texture. You know, he's, there's a lot of tasks going on here. It's not just about getting the food into his mouth. Look at all the fine motor. Lots of fine motor he skills he's got exposed to there. Now, it's going to take them longer to eat, and you need to stay at the table with them. Children want you at the table. If you leave them, what does that feel like? Abandonment. Abandonment. Thank you for whoever said that. Yes. It's okay to keep your children focused, but you don't have to force feed them to do that. It's okay to say, okay, Jose, I know. I know you really like looking out the window. Let's, let's get back here. Let's have dinner, okay? It's time for dinner now. You can look, we can go outside after dinner. Um, older children... Who can remember doing this? 
Nothing made me madder as a child than to be called into supper right in the middle of a fast and furious game of kickball. If I hurry, I can make it before our team is out. Okay? Expect them to stay at a time a reasonable amount of time. Stay at the table a reasonable amount of time. Two minutes is not a reasonable amount of time, correct? Neither is an hour. But children need to be excused from the table. Yes, you're done. Go play. And you're saying about, a, I'm saying for two and three year olds or who are independently sitting, would you throw out between 15 and 20 minutes or more like 20 minutes? Let's say they want to pop up and go someplace. Yeah, you've got a two or three year old or you say three or four. You know what, I'm gonna go with three or four. You got a three or four year old kid at the table with you, sitting there, either in a high chair or in a booster chair. The food is there. You know, they're there, but of course they're wanting to get onto their world. How long could you expect them to stay at the table? I still believe you can expect them to stay at the table at least 15 minutes because it's going to take you five minutes to focus them, right? Yeah. To get them to the business of eating. Then we know from studies and we know from watching our own children, you're looking at about eight to 10 minutes to eat and maybe a few minutes after eating to talk, I still think it's reasonable to expect even a three or four year old to be at the table for 15 minutes. Now what if you haven't been doing that with your children? What if they've been eating on the run in front of the table? What would be a reasonable time to start? Maybe five to 10? Yeah, you wanna start and build up to that. When children aren't allowed to choose how fast, some children will blatantly refuse to eat because they're overwhelmed. Some children will gobble and go. Tummy problems. Children that constantly have issues, my stomach hurts, I don't feel good. And you see that after the meal, that can be stress, that can be eating too fast. Because hurry, hurry, we gotta go, right? Joey's softball practice is in an hour. Um, kids will learn to drive you crazy by playing with their food, I know how to get her going. <laughs> These peas are going all over this plate three times. Yeah? Mm -hmm. And they learn that they can manipulate the entire family by making mealtime miserable. What's this, this little one doing? I think this is such an interesting picture of a child. She is checking that out, isn't she? She's just interested in that. Now, again, again, this is way too much food for her. Right? The plate is huge. This is a grown up portion. And look, this is also right here. This is like a grown up fork, which could be very hard for a child to navigate. Um, but yet, notice this is cut up into smaller bites that she can handle. So if you'll notice, that's what she's holding on to. I doubt she's even touched this. Even though there's some broccoli in there she could pick out and there's some noodles there she can pick out. That fork doesn't look like it's been touched. That expression I have seen that on the dress and looking at his food and then asking me, was this really a chicken? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yes. I, I, you've done that before. This child in a very quiet way is asking you for some input. <laughs> what is this? Am I supposed to eat it? And she might look over and say, are you eating it? <laughs> hmm, this is a lot safer. Maybe I'll just have the milk. Okay. Now this guy by contemplation. What do you think he's contemplating there? He's ready to go. Now what if what if what if this kid and this kid are at the same table together? Oh my gosh. Oh right? Right? He's, he's hungry, he looks hungry, he's ready to eat. Now actually, his plate looks pretty good size. This is probably the best size plate I've seen for a child in, through all these pictures that I've gleaned. He probably has less food on his plate than that little one does, did you notice that? And I'm wondering if him, at his age, if he was allowed to choose the food, to portion his own plate so that he gave himself what he thought he could eat. It looks more inviting, more colorful, right? What do you think it's hard? What do you think makes it hard to allow children to choose how fast to eat? 
by whatever's happened by the parents or the other adults at the table. The adults at the table have got an agenda, right? Yes. Things to do, people to see, chores to finish. Oh, what's on the table to eat too? Oh, I'm not liking it. I'm gonna hurry up and eat it. Yeah, sometimes what's on the table. I really don't like it, so I'm going to take a long time to eat it. Or I really don't like it, I'm going to hurry up and eat it, so I'm going to be done with it. Sometimes that. Um, Putting it in your napkin, I remember that. Oh, yeah. 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 If this child knows that he must eat all his food to leave the plate, he's going to, to leave the table, I mean, he's going to manipulate. Right? If he knows that's all got to go before he can get up, that's going to go in the napkin, in the trash, to Rover, who's down here. So uh, allowing children to determine how fast also means you have to allow children to leave food on the plate, right? When they say they're done, they're done, they're done. And if you want to reduce the pressure at mealtime, that is developmentally appropriate expectations. I'm not going to go through all of these. We don't have time, but on the Weebly website, um, I will have posted the developmental capabilities of these, of children at all of these stages. Um, and you'll see that these build on one another. You start here, and you see what, look at this. What do you think that we're starting as early as 11 months to train children how to be competent, capable eaters at the table? Why do you think this early? What's happening at 11 months? The need for autonomy. The need for, yes. Autonomy and the need for they're starting to do a little bit of preparation. And so they, that needs to be respected. Children at this age are seeing themselves as independent entities, separate from their parents. They are beginning to develop themselves, and they are transitioning from being highly reliant on breast or bottle to being more reliant on whole foods regular table foods for their sustenance, correct? So as soon as they get ready to start eating, that's when you put them at the table. You don't wait till they're 10. I say, okay, Frank, it's time for you to come to the table now. I really need for you to behave. And if you'll notice, each of these skills will build. Look at this child. This looks like they are at um, a Chinese restaurant or an Asian restaurant of some sort. Now, what is she doing? She's, she's using her chopsticks. Okay, nobody's born knowing how to do that. She's watching somebody else do it, right? Mm -hmm. So she's learned to model. Oh, I see you do that. I'm going to do that. Okay, what's the look on her face? Am I doing it right? Let, let me see that. Yeah. Yeah. Am I doing this okay? Am I going to get in trouble if this lands in my lap? Okay, look at her little hand raised. Mommy, look. Look. Look, Mommy. Now look at this kid. She's watching over here too for guidance. Now she's got just a little on her plate, right? And look, it's so convenient. When you go to these Asian restaurants, you get a little tiny cup. It's just built in. It just happens to work. Isn't that convenient? Look at this situation. At first glance, doesn't this look sweet? No. I'm glad you said that. What's going on with this? The age of the child mm -hmm. and the mother is the over-controlling or overpowering feeding the child. Come on. But Does anybody... Okay. I don't know. That might be okay. I don't know. It's take, you know. If you don't know the context of it, I mean, if she's constantly feeding her like that, it wouldn't be good. But once in a while, it might be okay. It might be a little ice cream. But this child might be happy because there's ice cream in here. She's excited about that. But look at her. She's ready to go. I don't know that mom needs to be controlling that arm. You're right. She looks, whatever's in that bowl. What it, that first of all, the bowl's huge. But second of all, whatever's in that bowl is pleasing that child. I don't think that she needs all that control, especially from behind. The mom doesn't trust her. I think a lot of times. The mom doesn't trust her. Parents sometimes, well, mothers usually are so worried the kids are going to get dirty. Well, they're they're just yeah. But look, the child doesn't even have on, I mean, that's pretty easy to wipe bare skin. That's the way they learn. They have to get messy. Well, and I'm looking at the interactive relationship. There's no eye contact. Mom's not able to read the child's no. cues, and the child isn't reading the mother's cues. No, the child has this, keep in mind, what children know about object permanence, is it really there if I can't see it? I don't know if it is or not, and this hand, 
witch comes out to control the spoon. I can't see mom. Is it mom? It smells like mom, but it could be a monster. Okay? There's a lot of things going on here that may or may not be helpful, but my guess is it's this little one, whatever's in this bowl, would be good to go. Now, what I'm thinking is I'm wondering if this is a, not a safe place for this child to sit, so the wear is not safe, so mom's got her in her lap, because this looks like a regular chair, and it would be better if the mom had sat cross and the child in the lap, or the mom and the baby could see one so another. There could be some there interaction. Could be some interaction. Oh. What about this one? <laughs> and what is this baby clearly telling the person that's feeding it? I'm, done. I'm either done or I'm not even developmentally ready to eat this I solid food. He's not developmentally ready. And the other thing is, look at the parent with a spoon. Mm -hmm. She doesn't look at the child in the face. She's not showing the child the spoon's coming. She's coming at the side. The, child, the spoon's coming at the side, and all of a sudden, wow, food's scary. The child is laying back in a car seat type thing. Does that mean the child is not able to sit up and develop, developmentally support his or her head? There's more food on this child's face than there probably is in, and this is probably a boy, his or her mouth, and she's clearly pushing the food out. I'm not ready to eat this way. Would you please stop? The child clearly looks zoned out. I'm not here. I'm somewhere else. I'm not even present. Ugh. Okay? As children get older, of course, things begin to change, but it's still important to have those boundaries. The snack time rules are still important. It's still important to say no to grazing. It's still important, even up here at this 12 to 17 year old place, set the expectation that there are going to be meals and snacks. Even if they're not always with the family, you will eat lunch. It may not be in front of me, but you're going to eat lunch. I expect you to have a snack. You're an active, growing child still. And at this is the point where you start to talk with your children about how to manage their food, how to prepare their food, how to make sure they're eating well. And again, here's a child who is trying hard, but maybe... Uh, this is not age appropriate for this child. Making the decision between this and this and all this food can make it really hard. What do you think are some things that make it hard for parents to have age appropriate expectations for their children? I just think they don't know. They may not know. Do most parents have children of varying ages? I mean, most of us don't have quintuplets and then stop. Yes, where everybody's in the same place at the same time. We have children. We might have a two-year-old, a four-year-old, a six-year-old, a 15-year-old. And so everybody's in a different developmental place. How do you keep up with it? It's hard. Also, I think there's a lot of conflicting information out there. A lot of conflicting information. A lot, of, very confusing for parents. And the variety, you got to do this throughout life. Frequently re-offer foods. Parents really... Um, let their children down when they assume that they know what their children like and don't like. Children will oftentimes surprise you about what they'll be willing to eat. You also have to be able to model trying and liking new foods. And plate appeal is important, even if for, for a small child. If I said to you, nursing home plate, what is your vision? Disgusting. Why would you say that? What would the food look like? Um, it's all mushy. Mushy? It's soft? soft not fresh. Cold? And a Process. lot of food on a plate. Process? A lot? What about colorless? Mm -hmm. That nursing home plate and that child's plate can often end up looking a whole lot alike if you don't really put the time into it. This, on the other hand, is this an appealing plate? It's pretty, isn't it? She's engaged with it, but it's still way too much. But she likes the colors. Look, she's going at it with both hands. She's into green and she's into orange. So she likes, and this is a pretty plate she's got, and it's got sides on it so she can manipulate it. She can grab a pea up the side if she wants to, but it's still way too much. But she likes the way this looks. She's interested in it. Okay. These two kids look like 
they've got this plate of different color veggies and some dip and looks like they're having fun. There's variety here. Now, th again, coming out of the, the ether is a broccoli freaking this poor child out. If this is the hand of a mom or a caregiver, what do you think is happening right now? Well, first of all, she's feeding him, and he's old enough to eat himself. She's feeding him, and he's way old enough to make his own choices, right? What else is happening? He doesn't like it. He clearly, this is a, clearly a scary food or an unknown food or a food that he may or may not like. And do you think that maybe this is a food that's being introduced at this age? Maybe he's never had broccoli before. Well, this is not the way for a first-time exposure at this age. These kids have probably been eating broccoli since they were what? Old enough to chew it? Mm -hmm. yeah. How you introduce foods at different ages are different. This is not the way to introduce to an 8, 9, or 10-year-old broccoli. They have a dip there, too. You know, maybe the, dip yeah, that looked like pretty naked broccoli, didn't it? Kind of scary. <laughs> probably without salt. Probably without salt, maybe without butter, maybe nothing. That just looks like something you'd find out in the yard. And I always told not to eat stuff out of the yard, right? That's what my mom told me. So, as you leave here today, maybe there are some things that you would want to try to do differently or to encourage other people to do differently. And some of those might be family meals. Maybe it would be deciding what, when, or where, setting those boundaries. Maybe letting your child decide how much or how fast or perhaps adding a little variety. Any one of these places is a good place to start, but they all have to start somewhere and be consistent. Once you start it, you want to stay with it. That's the key, don't go back. Thank you so much for your time, and I, I applaud you for trying to help us to create healthy, happy eaters.